lecture, uh, I would like to introduce to you, I think I wait for a second, Dr. Lipstadt, who is the Davat Professor of uh, Jewish Studies and Holocaust Studies at Emory University. She also is the director of the Rabbi Donald A. Tam um, Institute for Jewish Studies. She is author of many books, major books, discussing the um, America's um, um, press during uh, the Holocaust, um, during the 12 years of, of the Third Reich. Um, she also has written um, a major book, the major book on Holocaust denial, and her lecture today will deal with the trial she had a couple of years ago. Was it a couple of years ago? Five years ago uh, with uh, David Irving. Uh, please, Dr. Lipstadt, come and talk to us. Okay. Uh, can I see by a show of hands how many of you were here? I'm sorry to bother you. I just hear something about the bothersome nature of these lights. Do they bother you at all? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing happens here without Debbie. I just inscribed a book to Debbie Pfister. You can run my life anytime. <laughs> she did for the past two days. Wait, I'm just getting this on. Can I see by a show of hands how many of you were here yesterday? How many of you, uh, who wasn't here yesterday? Okay, it's about many, many of you were here. Um, so I'm going to, um, what I'd like to do uh, really this morning is give you some more of the background. Let's make sure this is on so I can wander. Okay. Um, give you some more of the background on the trial. Also come closer because I feel like I'm in the diaspora. You're in the diaspora or I'm in the diaspora. <laughs> um, talk a little more about some of the background of the trial. Talk a little bit more about some of the legal strategies. Um, show you uh, the resource, the um, website resource that uh, we've set up for with resources, on, information on the trial, explain to you our rationale behind it, um, and then open it up to discussion, because I'd really like to see this more as uh, discussion and open exchange. Um, one of the things that really um, helped shape the legal battle, and I was working with a master legal uh, strategist and tactician. And one of our decisions was never to ask the court for anything we weren't sure we would get. We only wanted, you know, slam dunk victories, two reasons, even before, before we went to trial. Because remember, the build up to the case was about uh, three years of intensive work. And it's slow and it's tedious and the court puts you off. And of course, they had two defendants with two different sets of lawyers, so there was a lot of coordination that had to go on, et cetera. Um, but there were points where we could have asked for a, the equivalent of a summary judgment when all the expert reports were in. If you look uh, here on the website, you see, see just some of these expert reports. Actually, they're all there. Uh, Richard Evans' report on uh, David Irving, Hitler, and Holocaust denial. Uh, if you just look at the content here, this is... Uh, uh, Evans' report on Ir from a historiographic perspective. In other words, Evans, as a professor, senior professor of history at Cambridge, was asked, does David Irving live up to the generally accepted standards of the historical profession? Historians may approach things differently. Some may still be Marxist. Some may be conservative, some may be more liberal, some may be take a feminist approach, whatever it is. But there's certain standards. You don't misrepresent data. You don't hide information. Remember I gave you that example yesterday of giving a footnote 800 pages of a trial and then quoting, uh, supposedly quoting from the trial. Uh, you don't do that because that makes it impossible. You give some sort, you give a, if, it, if it's a microfiche that doesn't have page numbers, you give a date. 
if it's a, most microfiche have frames, you give a frame, you give something. So does, you don't lie, you don't twist dates, you don't present it so in the Horthy example that it sounds like a meeting ended up when Horthy from Hungary says, you know, do you want me to kill the Jews? I can't expect to take them out to die like beasts in the field. And Hitler says, no, that's not necessary. Well, that was day one. On day two, he gives this murderous harangue. Um, so you don't switch it so it sounds like the meeting ended with uh, Hitler saying, no, that's not necessary. But you see here an incredible report. Hitler, the historian, his reputation, um, Irving, uh, Irving, I'm sorry, Irving, what is it? Uh, and Holocaust denial, definitions of the Holocaust. Um, this is a prominent historian writing for the court. So it's really a terrific resource because he brings all the intellectual uh, knowledge and all the research he's done, but it's done very succinctly um, and very straightforwardly. Um, but Irving's uh, tremendous admiration for Hitler, um, his claim, for instance, if you hear Reich's Kristallnacht, if you were to go into that, you would find that he talks about um, Hitler as supposedly trying to stop the attacks on the Jews uh, during Reich's Kristallnacht. The truth of the matter is there is a telex that goes out on the morning of uh, you know, the night after Kristallnacht, uh, that it says, and it comes from uh, not Hitler himself, but one of his uh, close associates, stop the arson against Jews and other business, Jews, businesses and other businesses. I'm paraphrasing. Irving takes that and he said, you see, here's Hitler trying to stop the attacks of Kristallnacht. He wasn't trying to, he didn't, as, as Richard Evans says on the stand, in a very poignant moment, he wasn't saying stop the beatings. He wasn't saying stop destroying the synagogues. He wasn't saying stop smashing the windows. He wasn't saying stop beating up the Jews. He was saying stop, they were saying stop the arson. What was the problem? Why stop the arson? What was happening? Other buildings. If you've ever been in a, in a European city, even in America, you know, you, you, we, I passed the Strip Mall Central on the way here, you know, not that we don't have it in Atlanta too, but if you burn one store, you're going to burn all the stores. You burn the synagogue. The synagogue is in the center, and not, it's usually on a side street in, in most German cities, because dating back to when they were built, but you're going to burn up other things. So entire blocks were going up in flames. So it says stop the arson. But what does that prove to, uh, to and uh, coming from Hitler's henchmen, what does that prove to David Irving? Proves that Hitler was trying to stop Kristall. Total misrepresentation. So that's just one, um, maybe we can move this a little closer. I, think, I, feel, I have a feeling that you have to have 1515 to see it. Can someone, can, can I, you look like a, not to be sexist, that could have been, hey, okay, we go. I'm not helping, I'm not participating, you're doing it. It's very kind of you saying you'll help me. But... Oh, I see it gets smaller. Well, let's pull this back. We're reorganizing here. A little bit. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I don't know if that made it any easier for you. Is that a little better? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so you have um, that kind of entry. You have here, this is the um, entry I was talking about, the meetings with in April 1943. Um, over and over again, um, you have examples, not of what happened. Remember, this was not a, these were not reports to discuss what happened. These were reports to look at how David Irving presented these things. The information either that we knew he had for instance, at one point, um, it's not in that section, but uh, Hitler gives a very famous speech. Oh, here, do you see number two, number B is Hit evidence in Hitler's trial, 1924. That's the material I presented to you yesterday. Give you another example. On December, I believe it's December 9th. When is uh, uh, Pearl Harbor? December 8th, right? 7th. 7th. So yes, it's 2 9th. So this was 9th. On December 9th, 1941, Hitler gives a speech to the leading Gauleiters, regional representatives, regional leaders of the Nazi party. Now this is exceptionally important. What is he going to say? What is he going to say, et cetera, et cetera? Well, Irv, in it, he makes some, again, murderous statements about Jews. And Irving claims that he only read half the speech. And he stops right before we're, 
Hitler talks about the Jews. Well, we went and looked at the actual, and so it's on glass plates, on micro, it's sort of the forerunner of microfiche. Well, we went and looked at the report, and where he claims to have stopped is in the middle of the page. Quite convenient, you know, if you want. So you, those are not the kind of things historians do. And that was what Evans' um, uh, report was all about. Um, it was, does this man fairly represent uh, the evidence either that's in his hand or um, that was accessible to him. Now, I want to talk about the bombing of Dresden, particularly since next Sunday, February 13th and Monday 14th, is the 60th anniversary of the bombing of Dresden. We're going to have a lot of 60th anniversaries in the next few months. So um, I talked in, to Dresden about the students. I didn't talk yesterday in the public, but I forgot who I said what to whom. And I'm just starting the book tour now, so, you know, this is not good. Um, but I didn't talk to you about Dresden in the talk, did I? No. Okay. Um, what's your general conception that you've learned through history, from Kurt Vonnegut, from the History Channel, whatever it is, of the bombing of Dresden? What's your, what is most people, if you have a lot, what, if you know the truth or the, uh, the criti critical story, what is the general popular conception of the bombing of Dresden that has entered World War II mythology, and I mean mythology is the story of, not myths, not untrue. What's the general perception of Dresden? Wiped out. Wiped out, firestorm. Civilian. Civilian. What else? Unnecessary. Unnecessary. End of the war. Dresden is this magnificent city. Even if you go to Dresden today. Retaliation for Coventry. Hmm? Retaliation for Coventry. We're going to show them. We're going to depress. The end of the war, it's February, mid-February, the war's going to be over in April. Now, of course, they don't know. It's not like, you know, you know that the semester, as I said to the students, is going to be over in April or May or whatever. They didn't know the war was going to be over in April. Hey. What had happened the month before in terms of military history? Battle of the Bulge. Battle of the Bulge. What's the Allied losses at the Battle of the Bulge? Well, about 10,000 10, prisoners. 20,000 prisoners, 80,000 casualties. Uh, 50,000 wounded is one, now maybe, okay, so let's say it's only 10,000, you know, prisoners. But that's tremendous casualties one month before. The Soviets are struggling westward. It's not, it's not a cakewalk. It's not a cakewalk. In fact, the Soviets are going to lose close to 80,000 soldiers in the Battle of Berlin. When everything is, when the Reich is destroyed. So from the point of view of the strategists, Dresden is, April is hardly, you know, it's hardly clear that the war is over. Maybe the Nazis have regrouped. Maybe Battle of Bulge was a turning point for them. So to say it's the end of the war is to use hindsight. And as a historian, you have to be very careful of looking at something based on what they knew then and not on hindsight until you acknowledge at a time. A. B, then this is, a lot of this comes from a very fine book that was recently published by Frederick Tr Taylor, British historian on Dresden. And he's gone into great depths, looking at these myths and the reality, et cetera. Number two, um, those you know, nice factories that used to produce china and chocolates uh, before the war, well, they had been transformed by the Germans into um, a very fine technical equipment, producing very fine technical equipment for the army and ammunition factories. In fact, what I've learned, and I didn't know this before, I mean, because there's, there's so many aspects of, of the Holocaust, not to say of World War II, is that the Germans spread their factory, their production out in existing, many in existing factories that used to make other things, often in population centers, which made it very hard for the Allies to bomb without bombing population centers. So Dresden is producing ammunition, is producing mili precision military equipment for the Wehrmacht. So to say that it wasn't producing anything, it was just this fine collection of buildings, is also wrong. It had the third largest military garrison in the Reich at the time. And if you've been to Dresden, you know this, it was a, it was a railway hub. So it didn't have, you know, it wasn't some, some just quiet little city that existed by itself and did no damage, et cetera. Now this is, has no, really no relation to it being bombed, but it's also important to know that it was a fiercely Nazi city. 
So much so that when Hitler commits suicide, he commits suicide about a week before the Germans fully surrender, that the party leader who essentially ran the city had a seven or eight day um, memorial, a mourning period going in the, in the city to, to, to acknowledge Hitler's suicide. So this is a strongly um, Nazi, which doesn't you know, one, figure one way or the other into its strategic importance, but it's, it's something sort of to put on the side of the radar screen. Um, moreover, what is, does it also figures into the bombing of Dresden is that the city fathers, and I use that word advisedly because they were no city mothers, uh, the city fathers um, were so sure that the city's cultural and historical importance would protect it from being bombed, that they refused to put in even the most basic um, air, air raid shelters, air raid defense, which, which up, so there was no place for people to go. Now, so given all that, that's one thing. So it's strategic non-importance is a very strong argument to set aside. Um, what about death toll? The general consensus, you look at all the historians who have worked on this, especially in recent years when we have a full set of documents, you know, now that the fall of the Soviet Union, the communist bloc, et cetera, um, is a death toll of somewhere between 20 and 30, some go as high as 40,000. In fact, the documents, the contemporaneous documents from the period, the Nazi documents from the period talk of a death toll, not the Nazi, the, the police documents from Dresden, talk of a death toll between 20 and 25,000. Now, uh, and that was contained in a, a document which is called TB 47, Daily Report 47. They talk about 20 to 25,000, okay? Um, so that's the general consensus. The mythology, scores and going as high as a quarter of a million people. Now, just, you can approach this material two ways, both, I mean, and you can approach it many ways, but two of the ways, in, in, the, in the trial, this came up very often, and I'll give you another example of it in a few minutes, um, based on historical information and based on logic. The death toll of a quarter of a million, 200,000 to a quarter of a million. Hiroshima, what was the death toll in Hiroshima? Actually, even less than 100,000. But that's with unconventional weapons. This is conventional weapons. So to think that with conventional weapons, if Hiroshima is, is between 70, some say higher, 70, 80,000, to think that this could have, you could have had in one night of strafing, two days, one night of bombing, killed a quarter of a million, beggars the imagination. Number two, where are the bodies? Yes, they do. Be, first, they try to bury them, and it's too much. They um, create in the old market square, the central area of Dresden, if you've ever been there. Um, they put out funeral pyres, actually, essentially, on grates, on, on metal grates, and they start burning the bodies. You can't, and over a couple of days, within a couple of days, the bodies are, are burnt. You can't cremate a quarter of a million bodies in that. It would take months. It would take ages. Um, so all these things speak against the popular mythology. Another thing that speaks against the popular mythology in terms of the strafing, in none of the American documents or the British documents do you have reports of strafing. More importantly, in none of the German documents, or reports on the bombing of Dresden, do you have reports of strafing. Whereas in other, there was strafing in other cities, but but, and so they frequently mention it, but they don't mention interest. And moreover, uh, Goebbels and his propagandists, who would mention the worst things they could about the Allies, you know, whenever they could, and use it to whip up anti-German sentiment, especially in this last stage of the war, get the people, you know, really motivated against the Allies, the propagandists, Goebbels' documents don't mention strafe. So where does it come from? Well, it comes from a number of sources. First, it comes, the strafing, not, not but the uh, high death toll, comes in part from Goebbels. Um, in fact, Goebbels puts out a document saying, official peace police report says, death toll looks like it will be between 200,000 and, uh, 200, and 250,000. What they did is take that report 20 and 25 and add a zero. 
So that's the first place it comes from. The second place it comes from is from communist propagandists. The Cold War, during the Cold War, what's the objective of East Germany? And of course the Soviet Union, East, uh, East Germany being the Soviet Union's closest ally, you know, or one of its closest allies, um, make the British and the Americans look bad, make the West look bad. Because the Soviets didn't do the bombing. They, so you want to build up the death toll? Communists were ever so happy. Let this idea of this terrible wrongdoing against the people of Dresden, let it enter the, 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 blood, the body of the people of Dresden so they will truly hate the Allies, the British and the Americans. So that's enough. But the most important place it enters mythology is in a book published by a young man who has just started writing as a historian or presenting himself as a historian. He has no college degree, but there are many good historians who don't have college degrees. I say that as you know, someone who produces, you know, who trains historians. Um, called Apocalypse 45, The Bombing of Dresden. His name is David Irving. And he begins with uh, telling this terrible story of strafing citing sources which don't mention strafing when you go look at the sources. Because what we did that nobody had ever done before as part of the trial, and what this website, which I, I don't really have time to show you fully, does is we followed his sources. We followed his footnotes. This is not something that historians generally do. Follow some, you trust. There's a, there's a bond of trust. But clearly, he failed that bond, and we followed this, the footnotes to find that. So he starts out in the first edition about talking about 40,000. But then he claims to have gotten a copy in 1964 of the TB47, the police report. And he suddenly sees that, the, he says, now I know the, the death toll was between 200 and 250,000. Well, what did he get? What did we discover? He was, this is a complicated story, but it's worth sort of laying out for you. One day, he's in Dresden in 1964, and he's visiting the home of a photographer. The photographer had a couple, I think, months before, visited the home of a Dr. Funfak. Okay, Dr. Funfa. The doctor had a copy of, TB40, of the TB47. The photographer hand copied it without the doctor knowing, surreptitiously, came home and typed it up. Irving saw the typed up copy and he said, oh, I want that. So the photographer's wife went and typed more copies. So based on a copy of a copy of a handwritten document surreptitiously copied from the source that was in the home of this doctor, Irving said, I found the source which shows me that it's between 200 and 250,000. And then he writes in his book, and the doctor was the chief medical officer, this Dr. Funfa was the chief medical officer of Dresden during the riot, so clearly he knew. The book is published in German. Dr. Funfa, this is in the 60s, they're all still alive. Dr. Funfa sees it immediately writes to David Irving, Dear Mr. Irving, I was not the chief medical officer. I was a urologist. I had nothing to do with, and he says, of course, Irving says the chief medical officer was president of the burning of the bodies. Nothing to do with the burning of the bodies. Once, I was happened to be at the old market square and saw the burning of the bodies. Please do not call me the chief medical officer. 1960, I forget the letter, foot facts letter to Irving. It's the late 60s. We find this in Irving's files because we get access to his files, and it's there. Fast forward to year 2000 in the courtroom, Irving said, I had that information from the chief medical officer. And my barrister, God bless him, British understatement, goes like this. Uh, the chief medical officer, Mr. Irving? Yes. Would that be Dr. Funfak? Yes. Would that be the same man who wrote you a letter, that, that, that I was never the chief medical officer, et cetera, et cetera. On top of which, Irving gets a letter from a man named Theo Miller. It's all in the report. You can find it there. I summarize it in the book as it, as it comes out in the trial. Um, gets a letter from a man named Theo Miller, who was in charge of, for the Dresden city during, during the bombing, was in charge of keeping a record of who had died. So he does this based on the number of burials, on the number of people cremated, on uh, people missing, on wedding rings that are found. They do a very intricate system. And Theo Miller said, comes up with a number, maximum 40,000. And he writes to Irving, quite, you know, point by point. It's an unbelievable letter because it also comes during the communist period. He's writing something that the communists are not interested 
and having put out there that the death toll is lower. And then he says, and Mr. Irving, it's virtually impossible on a grading, I forget how many meters it was, six meters by seven meters, to burn a quarter of a million bodies in the time that we were burning bodies. So your numbers are completely off base. Irving's book is reissued, no mention of Theo Miller's letters, no mention of Funfax's protests. So on the court, we ask him about Dr. Miller. And he says, oh, Miller, he was fantasizing. Remember, he's writing when the communists, so he's probably saying what the communists want to hear. No, the communists want higher numbers, not lower numbers. So when Kurt Vonnegut writes Slaughterhouse Five, which is really the way most people learn about Dresden, he uses Irving's work. So I'm not diminishing a death toll of 30 to 40,000. That's no small thing. But, but this is what happens. Now, of course, in, in terms of mispresentation of the information. Now, why is it so important to a David Irving that Dresden looked like this terrible allied outrage? Why, why is it important? What's, what's going on here? Why would it be, why would it be, what would be the, the use? Why? First of all, I mentioned this yesterday, Irving is a great believer, I think I mentioned it yesterday, um, is a great believer in immoral equivalencies. You know, yes, the, ally, the, Axis, the Nazis did bad, but the Allies did worse. So if he can drive the death toll up to 200,000, 250,000, he says, oh, he'll admit that there were 87,000 people who died in Auschwitz because we have death records, death books of 87,000 people. When you arrived at Auschwitz, if you were sent directly to the gas chamber, you never entered any record. But if you weren't sent directly to the gas chamber, you were, your entry, your presence there was recorded. So we have the records of 87, since the fall of the Soviet Union, this is information that's all come out in the last 10 years, um, we have the death books of 87,000 people who were, died at Auschwitz. So Irving will say, 87,000 people died at Auschwitz over four years, that's terrible. But 200,000 people in one night of bombing, that's a holocaust. So you can, you deal with those, the thing, the killings you can't deny, but you can still make the allies look worse. Going on over that information on Dresden took Richard Evans and his researchers, um, get this, hello, come back, what happened here? Yay, Debbie, run my life. Um, um, took them ages. But this is the kind of stuff we did. Not eureka kind of discoveries, but basic following of the research, following of the footnotes. Okay, terrific, thank you. Uh, following of the footnotes. So much so, one of the um, uh, great pieces, of resources that we use um, here is, uh, This, the, I, I briefly showed you Evans' trial. This, uh, Evans' report. This is Hayo Funke's report of uh, Irving's connection to uh, right-wing extremists in Germany um, and the other reports, which are all fantastic resources. But what I want to show you, um, here, closing statement for the defendants. What we eventually did, let's see if we can find the Dresden piece here. Auschwitz, Dresden, here we go. Um, we, in the last days of the trial, we put together for the judge what we used to call a crib sheet, you know, point by point by point of the things Irving said, where he said them, and what the facts were. But you have here claims made by the P, that's the, the plaintiff, because Irving was the plaintiff, I was the defendant, um, as to the numbers killed. Uh, in the 1966 Corgi, the Italian edition, more than 100,000 between a minimum of 100 and 250,000. Um, in the 1971, more than 100,000. 1977, quarter of a million. This is after he's gotten these reports from Miller and from Funfac. Uh, it's 50,000, 100,000 um, at his press conference in eight, 1989 between 100 and 250,000, quite a spread, but still way over. Um, and you see this over and over again. Um, and on, on the trial, he mentions it here. Uh, during, um, during the trial, he mentions 135,000 as the most probable figure, all um, quite uh, out of bonds. 
But you see here, you have a summary here of all this information on Dresden. Like when you go over here, um, this is when it's something listed like this, that's the 13th day of the trial, because the transcripts are all here as well, uh, page 117, lines 25, uh, 15 to 25. So you can go here and reconstruct, and, and students have been using it um, during, I mean, it's a small website, but during the Auschwitz Memorial, we were, it almost collapsed under the attention it was, it was getting. Um, but we do that over and over again to show how he um, really uh, convoluted the information. Similarly, uh, you go up to, um, Uh, his, uh, his, his comments about execution of Jews by shooting, um, Hitler's speeches, each of them summarizing the information that was in the, uh, I'm trying to find for you the uh, trial, um, Hitler's trial. Here we go. Uh, the Nazi putsch. And where he talks about um, you know, we show how he completely misconstrues everything that went on there. But on this little trial, we, on this, we have uh, a tremendous amount of information. Similarly so on Reich's Kristallnacht, et cetera. So making it an important resource. Sure. Today, you said that you would talk about the personal perspective of this. I'm going to get to that in a minute, okay? I'd love to hear about how you... Get to that in a minute. Um, but I want to show, because well, this is also part, because there was a um, double kind of thing going on at the same time. There was this intense, meticulous research. Not going to the judge and standing up, oh, the man's a terrible man, here's what he said about Jews, the man's a terrible man, et cetera, et cetera. Drowning him in evidence, tying him up, so that if you present him the uh, trial transcript from the 1924 trial, where it says the true story of that delicatessen raid, you either say to him, well, does this show that the guy was thrown out of the party as the testimony of the trial, his Hitler's trial shows, for destroying the delicatessen or for taking off his Nazi emblem? He either has to say, yes, it's because he took off the Nazi emblem, so you lied in your presentation in your book, or, He's got to say, no, it doesn't, it shows, and he's got to lie about what the evidence shows. So he's boxed in. It's not, you know, any, any uh, Perry Mason moments. It's, it's the documentation. So there was a part of me that was very much as a historian, tied up in facts, figures, documentation, done very meticulously. There was another part, and I talked about it briefly yesterday, in terms of the personal connection, particularly but not only with the survivors. I'll give you an example that also ties into the documentation. Um, Robert Jan von Pelt, in his report on um, Auschwitz, or actually not, it wasn't, it wasn't so much in his report, but in um, his testimony, is asked by Irving, uh, von Pelt at one point had said that, um, let's see, yeah. Uh, von Pelt at one point had said that Close to half a million people were, were gassed in um, the uh, gas chamber number two. If you've been to Auschwitz, you've seen, that's the bombed one where you can still see the roof um, of the gas chamber. And Irving says, we have the documents, we have the plans, you know, they're in the Auschwitz archives, we introduced them in court, the architectural drawings. There's one elevator. Since this was a building that was originally built as a crematoria and was transformed to be a gas chamber, it is, from the German perspective, highly inefficient. The gas chambers are on the bottom, and the ovens are on the top. Um, and there's one elevator to take the bodies from the bottom to the top. And uh, Irving says, couldn't have, half a million people couldn't have died there. He's questioning von Pelt, to understand. There's only one elevator. Professor von Pelt, do some back of the envelope calculations for me um, to show that this elevator could have done it. So von Pelt says, I don't do back of the envelope calculations. And Irving says, do them. 
and the judge doesn't intervene, so he's a witness. He can't say, I don't do it on principle. I'm an academic, I'm a scholar, whatever. So he begins to figure weights of corpse, and he's very good. Van Pelt had some shaky moments at the beginning, but at this point, his, he was on the stand for about six days. His testimony was first rate. Um, he begins to say, well, you know, you take, there were body weights of, let's say, you know, 60 kilos and body weights of people who had come from, or, or 80 kilos of people who had come straight from their homes and body weights of people who come from ghettos who were emaciated. So an average body weight was X, Y, Z. It was so many meters they had to go up. So the elevator moving up that rate took so long. Perfect testimony. Then Irving says, well, it couldn't have been, the bodies would have gotten, st the doors wouldn't have shut if you say it held 20 bodies. So uh, Van Pelt says there were no doors. It was a flatbed elevator. And Irving says, thinks about it and says, aha, that's the problem. They would have gotten stuck in the shaft. You know, first having doors is the problem and then not having doors, you know, back and forth. Um, and Van Pelt answers, and it is. By this point, I'm experienced enough to know this is perfect testimony back and forth, no extras, and I'm sitting there and saying, yes, this is good, good, Robert John, perfect, perfect, because he's just, just the facts, you know, just the facts, uh, to, to quote Joe Friday from, from Dragnet, and it's really terrific testimony, and I'm very pleased, because it's really showing, showing Irving's miscalculations, it's showing that uh, he, what Irving says about these gas chambers is completely wrong, etc. and I'm feeling very pleased, and then I turn around and I look at the um, gallery, and there's a woman who had identified herself to me earlier that day, which was very common as a survivor. I sometimes would walk in and survivors would put uh, a piece of paper in my hand with names and they would say, this is my evidence. Or if some of you look up Mo Stein, Mo Stein is in the book, an email he sent me uh, right after the trial mentioning the names of his family who were killed. Um, uh, you know, and I see this woman sitting with her head in her hands. So you know, I go from this perfect testimony forensically perfect testimony to this reminder of what this is causing people. So there were those kind of um, ups and downs all the time. Um, another element which really predates some of this, because now most people think, agree that this, you know, was a, most people who understand what the, how British libel laws work knew I had no choice but to fight back. Um, but there were those people in the beginning who thought, including uh, leading members of the British Jewish community, who said to me, settle. Mm -hmm. So when I first heard this, you know, I was flabber I, I was speechless, which for me is a very rare condition. Um, and I happened to be standing next to Anthony, and Anthony said, uh, Deborah's my uh, client, so let me ask you, what do you think she should settle for? Five million Jews, four million Jews, two gas chambers, three, I mean, it's absurd. You can't settle. Um, as I said yesterday, it would have entailed apologizing and withdrawing my book from circulation. But there were people who said, well, you apologize and people will be able to see that your apology is not really an apology kind of thing. There were people who said, you should ignore the whole thing, which of course, as I pointed out, I was talking to Alan Dershowitz uh, right before the trial, and um, he said to me, they've never been sued for libel, you can't just ignore the libel suit. Plus the fact he would have won by default. So even though now everybody agrees, oh, this was a, uh, most people agree, that this was a terrific thing and a right thing, that wasn't the case at the beginning. It really wasn't the case. The American Jewish community understood much more quickly. It took the British Jewish community a longer time to come around to it. Um, and they were very nervous. They were also nervous it was happening in their backyard. He's going to get reams of publicity. He's going to be on the front page. He's going to have his say. And I was, as I mentioned yesterday, I wasn't supposed to talk to the press because I wasn't, give, the reason I wasn't giving testimony was that um, my barrister, who was terrific, Richard Rampton, was just a godsend. Uh, Rampton said, you're being sued about what you wrote in your book. There's nothing you can add that the court needs to know by your giving testimony. What you, we have to prove that what you wrote in your book was true. That's what, that's what our responsibility is. We don't have to put you on the stand because you're being sued. For, and that's, by the way, standard operating procedure in many libel trials. Somebody asked the judge afterwards, you know, what about Deborah Lipset not taking this? And he said, who the judge who had been a libel barrister, a barrister specializing in libel for many years before he was elevated to the high court, um, uh, said, no, I, didn't I wouldn't have expected her to testify. But because I wasn't testifying, they didn't want me talking to the press. So Irving couldn't come to the judge and say, she's on CNN, on the BBC last night, but she won't talk in your court. 
So, you know, having to keep silent. Uh, so for many days in the beginning, Irving, was, Irving says this and Irving says that, and I would go to Anthony Julius and I would say, we can't, I gotta talk, I gotta, we gotta challenge. She said, Deborah, there's only one article we're interested in. The judge rules X, Y. And that was very trying. But it's one of the reasons we got, and we didn't litigate in the press. Anthony was in adamant on that. We don't want this litigated in the press. We're going to litigate in the courtroom and come down with such a slam dunk ruling that it's going to bury him. And I think, I think it was the Observer who said, or the Times of London who said, never had a uh, libel verdict been, been dumped on the head of a plaintiff the way this one was. Um, or another one said, you know, history has had a day in court and won a resounding success. So it was, a, it was the right strategy, but it was a very difficult strategy uh, to face uh, and to deal with. Let me stop here, and uh, we have some time for questions. Take questions, comments, um, so I could go on. Yes? I remember uh, when I first read Cuban mm -hmm. I remember 16, and I was right. very interested in the Cuban Senate. And I remember reading this book, and at that time, if I recall, it was one sentence. Yeah, I'll tell you what. The difference in QB7 was there was a jury. But it was a jury and it was a hate penny. Right. Okay, but in any case, I remember, and as a very young person reading this, I was thinking, well, why did he do this? Was he so incredibly delusional that he really didn't believe that this is what well, he the did? the truth was going to come out. And in this case, after listening to you last night and listening to this, how did he ever think he would possibly well, win this? It's a very good question. Just a little bit of background. If you haven't read QB7, it's a great read. Uh, it's the story, and this, by the way, uh, serious books. It's a, it's a, it's a novelistic account of your, what happened to yours after writing. Um, and I talk about it in the, oh, actually, no, we, we, we cut it out of the book. Um, it was in an earlier version, an uh, earlier draft of the manuscript. Um, in um, Exodus, uh, Uris makes brief reference to a Polish doctor who was a prisoner at Auschwitz, but who said who was responsible for the deaths of, I don't know, 10 to 15,000 people, women or something like that. He was a doctor in Auschwitz, and he, he slightly changes the spelling of the name. The doctor had been a Polish prisoner, um, had been responsible for deaths, but like 200 or 300, but had come to Britain after the war and had remade himself into sort of a contemporary Albert Schweitzer. And when the book comes out, the guy sues Eurus. And what happens is they find the, um, uh, Eurus's lawyers find the medical documentation uh, in Poland from, and with the doctor's name signed there. But, but the, and the doctor is ruined. The doctor's ruined because it's shown that he did take part in these trials. He wins the case. Eurus loses. He wins the case because um, he was only responsible for the death of 300 to 500 or something and not 10,000 or whatever it is. But the uh, verdict against Eurus is the hey penny, the lowest coin in the realm. So it's one sentence. This, but because we had a judge, how do we get a judge and not a jury trial? Um, and I, I tell the story in the book. At one point, Anthony, who refused on principle to, to look at Irving, talk to Irving, would turn his back on him in pretrial hearings, etc. One pretrial hearing, he walks up to him and says, Mr. Irving, this is a very complicated case. It's going to be hundreds of pages of documentation. And every footnote in one of these reports has to have the actual original, a copy of the document that they're referring to. He said, there's going to be too much for any jury to read. And Irving says, yes, very complicated, very difficult. Mr. Irving, don't you think we should just have a, a bench trial and not a jury trial? And he says, yes, yes. And he immediately turns around and says to the, the, the master, who's the pre-judge judge, you know, the pre uh, we want a jury trial. We want a, a, a bench trial. We were delighted. Because even though we probably would have won, a jury is much more, I mean, if they'd gone by the evidence, of course we would have won. But a jury might not have read the thousands of pages of documentation, which the, which the judge uh, did. But, um, and so what Anthony clearly did, it played to um, Irving's ego, because he was apparently, we, we surmised, so impressed that he was involved in a case that Anthony Ju uh, Julius, this prominent lawyer, thought was complicated. You know. um, what was working in Irving's brain, I don't fully know, but the man is an egotistical maniac. Or as one little nine-year-old wrote me, he said, uh, I think the man who S-E-W-E-D-U is a uh, maniac, uh, you know, M-I, whatever it is, I love the letter, it's on the wall in my office. Because um, I had given him a copy of the book, and he said, and he they had bought a copy, I gave him a copy of another of my book, so it says, dear Ms. Lipstadt, thank you for the sign, sinning my book, signing my book, and the one you gave me for free. I think the man who sued you was a maniac. Um, 
In any case, um, he is a maniac. He's an egotistical man who has never been called to account, who has never been challenged, whose footnotes have never been followed. He wanted that attention. He thought he would be able to pull it off. He's, he knows he's lying when he makes these things up, goring goggled at the exchange. But once he writes it, he convinces himself, I think, it's that it's true. That's my impression. And then, I'm sorry, wait a minute, behind you, and then you, yeah. Uh, uh, yesterday, Professor Lipster, you said that um, Irvin brought his uh, suit essentially because uh, not uh, uh, when you challenge him or call him a Holocaust now it, dim it diminishes his work as a legitimate mm -hmm. scholar of history and at the same time it underscores his penchant for racism, anti-Semitism and so forth. Uh, my question is, is, do you see this as the, as the overall or the broad agenda of the denials, uh, this perpetuation of uh, anti-Semitism and racism is, is, or, or are there other no, things I, that they think I they think might gain? you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Holocaust denial is a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, and even though some of the people who deny the Holocaust say, well, they, they, the Jews didn't die, but they should have died because they really were you know, worthy of dying, of being murdered. They didn't die, they were murdered. Um, but at its heart, it's anti-Semitism and it's racism, um, and that's what it is. And that's one of the reasons uh, that right now the heart of Holocaust denial, the most active place in the world for Holocaust denial is the, is the Muslim slash Arab world. Uh, and there are some Arab intellectuals and Muslim intellectuals who said, this is stupid, this diminishes us. But they have not been able to counter the trend. It's very much there. Yeah. Well, Deborah, since uh, you said historian needs some perspective, it's been five years since the trial. Just two questions. One, how has your life changed mm -hmm. because of that uh, central part in, in your life? How's it changed? And second, what impact do you think you've made in Holocaust studies and the impact you've made by, by going through this experience? Okay. Um, the first, in terms of how my life has changed, um, on some level, not very much. I still teach my classes, go to work. I'm teased by my friends if I get, you know, think I'm too important or whatever. Um, on the other hand, I have a voice that I, I have the voice, the same voice, but it has an audience that it didn't have before. And one of the things I've done, particularly in the last year, because we really only finished the stuff in June of 2004 with my decision not to pursue him for funds. Up until then, I was involved in it all the time. Um, I have a certain voice, uh, audience, or hearing. I get a hearing that I might not have gotten before. Uh, this past semester, this fall semester at Emory, um, I was sitting on the campus one day, and it was, it was during the summer, and it was shortly after Colin Powell had talked about Darfur as a genocide. And I realized, I thought about it, and I said, my students always ask me, why didn't America do something during the Holocaust? Why didn't the world respond? And it's a complicated, I explain, you know, there was a war going on, there was a depression, all sorts of, not answers, not, not explanations, but trying to contextualize it for them, and they hear it as rationalization. Uh, if I, when I was their age, I would have called it apologia, you know, apologetics. Um, but I think, you know, what's gonna happen 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when people say, like, when they ask me what I did during Rwanda, I'll be, it's very simple, nothing. So what did you do during the Sudan? Nothing. You know, that can't be. So I called my colleagues in African American studies just because they were in the office next door. I said, Leslie, let's get together. And when I explained to her what was going on, someone else was there and said, well, you should get the people in African studies and then the people in the ethics center heard and then we brought in uh, students. So around the table we had, you know, uh, Middle Eastern studies, Jewish studies, ethics center, African American, African studies. We had the students from the Muslim Student Association, we had the students from Hillel, and we set up a semester long series of educational things on Darfur. Um, I've become, I was active before, I'm a bit more active now, and whenever I'm asked in terms of the Armenian genocide, which is a terrible, I mean, that Turkey still denies it, you know, and people say, well, we don't have all the documents. There are enough documents. You know who was the best source on the Armenian genocide? Ambassador Morgenthau, the father of Henry Morgenthau. The ambassador, Jew, prominent Jew, appointed ambassador to, to Turkey, to Constantinople, um, who writes what's going on. In fact, the Armenian community is republishing his diary. Um, which with his story's memoir, which tells that story. So I try to use it in that sense, to use my voice in that sense. Um, 
the impact of the trial and this whole thing, I think that um, one of the reasons where you get things, and again, it's not just the trial, but the trial certainly is the capstone event, that these Muslim and Arab intellectuals say to their fellow journalists, fellow intellectuals, so-called intellectuals, this makes us look silly. It's because Holocaust denial has been laid every argument as it stood through the appeal in 2001 was shown to be complete. You know, if I wasn't being taped, I'd use a, you know, four-letter word or whatever. Um, and I think even in this rise of anti-Semitism, even from the far right, we haven't seen that because it's been shown. We now have the arguments. That's one of the reasons why I want to show you the website. We have the documents. We have the arguments. You can trace it. You can build it. You can build a case. You can go in any way you want. Um, and I think that that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Hello, Stad. Um, your book is a, I would say, a tsunami against those of us teaching, because I'm finding in the classroom less and less do my students not only know about the Holocaust, but about any genocides. Mm -hmm. And in 15 weeks, trying to teach them what they don't know anything about, mm -hmm. from Armenia to Africa today, it is difficult and more and more difficult. Do you have any suggestions? Oh, God. You know, sometimes you think about time frames to put things in perspective. The 1960s was when a lot of us were learning about the Holocaust and stuff like that. Um, for the student today to talk, to go back to the 60s, for us, the 20s, you know, it was 40 years to the 20s, and the 20s seemed a long time ago. So when you talk about students about the 40s or whatever, you know, it's, it's ancient history. Um, it's very hard, and, and Darfur, where's Darfur, and, you know, and Rwanda, you should all see Hotel Rwanda, by the way, it is an absolutely compelling, devastating, and I don't mean good in the story, but good movie on top of it, you know, they haven't, the, the filmmakers have not um, sacrificed good movie making for telling this compelling story. Romeo Dallaire, the Canadian general, who was the Canadian UN general in Rwanda, Try to alert the world. There's a short little film you can get from the Holocaust Museum, uh, A Good Man in Hell, um, of an excerpt of Dallaire's presentation at the Holocaust Museum and the story of trying to alert the world to, to the genocide in Rwanda. The Sudan, you know, on one hand you can say we haven't learned very much. I don't know. If I had an easy answer for you, I would have packaged it a long time ago. I think it's just a matter of the facts, the facts, the facts, and teaching it to them. Um, one thing I'm very strong on is we don't have to emotionalize. We don't have to exaggerate in any way. We don't have to play, you know, they'd not, the Nazis did not make Jews into soap. I said that once. I said, you shouldn't say that because, you know, I said, it doesn't make them good guys, you know? It's just a fact. We have to be very careful about the history. Telling this history, we can use, to borrow a phrase from the Jewish liturgy, the High Holiday liturgy, a still small voice because the facts scream for themselves. Um, and we can just hope. We won't reach all students, but we can just hope. Um, and people say, you know, well, so what has the world learned from the Holocaust? You have all these, uh, and, um, you have all these genocides, et cetera. Um, I don't know if there hadn't, would have been more if we hadn't, you know, been studying and teaching and talking about the Holocaust. I do know that when America finally went into um, uh, the former Yugoslavia, to bring an end to the killing. It was in part because uh, Bill Clinton became convinced that he would have been accused of standing silently by once again. I know that when uh, George W. Bush saw the reports on Rwanda and American action on Rwanda, he wrote in the margin, not on my watch. And initially, he was one of the strongest on Darfur. He's been a little quieter now, but he, you can see Nicholas Kristof's, um, go back to Nicholas Kristof's articles in the Times or go on his webpage, you'll see that, that stuff. So, um, it's pretty weak if the best answer I can give you is but if. But that's the best you know, we can do and all we can hope is that people like you who prepare the students who eventually come and take my class, um, you know, uh, or who do re graduate level research on this and eventually go on to study in it, um, and the, the high school teachers and the others that, that they, you know, we do our work, um, but again, um, the facts, the facts and, and the bigger picture. Yes. 
Late here. I was wondering if I could videotape the remainder of your lecture. I'm a, I'm a documentary producer. If you can what? Uh, videotape the remainder of the lecture. I got here late. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm, you've got about a few minutes, but yeah. Is that all that's left? It's, it's okay. I'll give you a, a release for it later. Um, yes. Can you come in on the fact, you know, like on the PBS series, they always referred to the Nazis, not the Germans, mm -hmm. but the contemporary always said Germans. In your book, you say the uh, Germany during the Nazi period, and I've always thought if you just say Nazis, it does take away from I the agree Holocaust. With you. I agree with you. When you say Nazis, or when the Nazis took over in Germany, you're suggesting to some people, like the Nazis were little green Martians who Martians, landed, right. landed in, in the middle of Berlin and took over. Um, and that's why I insist on using Germans or Nazi Germany or things like that. Um, I don't know what decision the BBC made. Maybe it was simply a um, you know, ease of terminology in, in terms of a... Uh, you use the word German, German. You always say Nazis. Nazis. I, I try to use... Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you want to say the Nazis. But, but clearly, um, you know, they don't take over. They win the election. I mean, they put together a coalition, but still, there's not a coup. Now, it's a winning of the election that comes with terror of their opponents. But it's not, you know, and then you see the famous Lenny Riefenstahl films and other films. This, of course, you know, it's a, you can't, a film is only filming so much. And we do know that there was opposition. I just saw a very interesting uh, documentary on the Red Orchestra, which was a, uh, a resistance movement. Some of you may know about the White Rose um, and others. Um, and there were Jews who were saved, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's wrong to project that you're absolutely right. By the way, there's a very good book by Marianne Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N, uh, who teaches at NYU called Between Dignity and Despair, Jewish Life in Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1945. And she's a good lecturer. She'd be a good person to have for this. Um, and she talks about the daily life in Nazi Germany during that period. What was it like to send your kids to school? They were still going to a German, not I, Aryan, quote unquote, not Jewish school, knowing that the teacher was going to show up in a Nazi uniform. What was it like? You know, we always say that you couldn't sit on benches. So what was on park benches? He said, oh, big deal, everything else that went on. For the elderly people who, who were the biggest chunk of the Jewish population in Germany because so many young people had left, one of the few joys they had was a few hours each day to go sit in the park and sort of be, you know, normal and sort of, and, and suddenly you, you sat on a bench which said four Jews only so everybody could recognize you as a Jew. What was the impact of wearing a star? Which you weren't allowed to cover up. You know, there's a wonderful story that Marion Kaplan tells in there of um, a woman, I think it's in Darmstadt, who was in a, what we would call coffee clutch group. You know, they met every Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock in the same cafe, um, in the same corner, alcove, etc. And um, the minute Hitler comes to power, January 30th, 33, she stops going. About three or four weeks later, so it's in February, you know, it's not very far, long after, she meets one of the women from the coffee clutch in the street, and the woman says, you must come back to us. We don't support that man. You must come and, um, and join us again. So the woman writes in her memoirs, um, she said, you know, I lay awake at night, and we would say, she thought, I would evaluate their body language. She doesn't use that term, but you know, are they uncomfortable? Do they, should I go again? How do they feel about my being there? Is it strained? Whatever, and she gets up that morning, screws up her courage, and goes to the cafe at the appointed time, and looks over in the alcove where they sit, and there's nobody there. Those are little things, you can say they weren't there because they were terrorized, they weren't there because they supported Hitler. I don't know why they weren't there, but the Jews, it, she shows how this creeping sort of isolation takes place upon the Jews. And the other thing which takes a big commitment to read but is a unbelievable tour de force is of course Victor Klemperer's uh, two volume diary. A professor in Dresden, in Dresden, who was saved by the bombing of Dresden. He, had just, he and his wife had just gotten their deportation order, she wasn't Jewish, to, to Terrazin, when the bombing occurs. So they say, oh, we lost our papers, and they pass as non-Jews. So the bombing saves Klemperer's life. Um, he would maybe, uh, or going to the, to the deportation, certainly. Um, that's another, shows that daily, daily death by a thousand million cuts, to paraphrase. Did you ever make any correlation between the Holocaust and how the Ku Klux Klan ruled the South for 100 years in this country? No, no. Um, first of all, that's not my area. And um, 
you know, I have no love lost for the Ku Klux Klan. Hor horrendous and frightening and the lynchings. I mean, if you saw the postcard exhibit on the lynchings that was traveling the, um, through Emory sponsorship at one point. Um, the Ku Klux Klan was not out to murder all the African Americans. Any African American who quote unquote got out of line looked at a white woman or who was accused of looking at a white woman uh, didn't say sir even if they were 60 and the, the person they were saying sir to was 22, you could lynch them. Life was cheap, life was dirt cheap. But the idea was to keep those black people in their place doing your work for you. You didn't want to murder them and get rid of them. They were making your factories run. They were cleaning your houses. They were raising your children. They were working your fields. You know, whatever it, uh, it was, was. So the idea was to denigrate humiliate, and if necessary, kill to keep the others in line. The Holocaust is different, and this is not an issue of comparative pain, because I sure as hell wouldn't have wanted to be a black person in the South in the 19th century or the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and I lived, when we moved to New York, I lived down the block from Andy Goodman in the 60s. Um, but the Nazis, um, so this is not in any way to, to cut the Ku Klux Klan the least bit of slack. It's a blot on the history of our nation, not just that they existed, but the way we allowed them. Bigger blot, not that they existed, bigger blot is the way this country allowed them to exist. Um, but the, the German Nazi party perspective, here's why I would use Nazi, the National Socialist perspective uh, or approach to Jews was kill them all. So much so that in June 1944, after the landing at Normandy, the, Nazi, the Germans take ships and go to the island of Corfu, load up the 1,200 Jews in Corfu, take them to Auschwitz, and 121 return. After the landing, now the, I, I don't know, I'm not a military, you know, strategy, I assure you those ships could have been used for something else. So that's the, the difference. Um, now you could say, well, that's their story. By saying that, you sort of give the Ku Klux Klan the free ride, not at all. If you want to look at it within the context of this nation, no free ride, not the least bit of slack. If you're doing comparative kinds of genocides, horrors, etc., you know, I've been accused by this Ward Churchill, this maniac from uh, Colorado. He's, I, he's been on my radar screen for years. He's written about me. I've ignored him. So now I'm in this sort of bind of wanting. What's happening is, you know, who wore trade, the one who talked about the people in the World Trade Centers, the little Eichmanns. He's accused me of being a genocide denier because I say what happened to the uh, Native Americans or what happened to others is not a, the same as the Holocaust. I mean, he's a completely convoluted, disgusting human being. Um, but he's being turned into a poster child for free speech and for tenure. Um, but uh, um, it's different, it's different. Not better, not less bad, or not less bad, different. And uh, historians, that's how historians, that's how we all study, you, I mean, and that's how we all figure out life around us. This building is bigger than this one, this building is older, younger, we make categories, not everything is the same. And that's what we do in this, it's not special pleading for the Jews or special arguing, but it's, it's differentiating. But never in human history did we see an entire state machinery from the top leadership to the banks to the post offices who delivered the deportation orders to the people who collected the clothes and sorted the clothes to the person sitting making the train schedules to all those kind of things. An entire nation focused on the murder of an entire group of people in the borders and outside the borders Young, old, it didn't matter. The closest you get to it is the Armenian Genocide. And then Rwanda, I think, to some extent. The Armenian Genocide, there, there's still certain differences, but, but that, that's the closest you get in a, in a comparison. Other questions or comments? Yes? Okay, we're just, one, one more, and this is it. Well, two quick things. One, I just want to say thank you for standing up for yourself and for the cause, because I know it was a personal cost to you, and it's so important to all of us. So thank you. In terms of ongoing genocide, I heard something very damning, and that was that when Rwanda was ongoing, that this country was paying more attention to